We all, I think, associate very naturally improvisation with jazz. And many of us, I think it would be fair to say, when asked whether the same applies to a classical concert, would say, well, no. So in the experiment, we actually created a situation of a live concert. The three players were connected to EEG equipment, in addition to two members of the audience. They heard each piece twice, once in an unimprovised mode and once in an improvised mode, but they weren't told the order. So they just had to react to each piece as they heard it. One of the interesting things about this study is because it was multidisciplinary, we were able to attack the problem from three different angles at the in the same study. So we could look at it musicologically. Uh, David Dolan was able to analyze the musical structure and what the performers were actually doing. And Henrik Jensen was able to measure what was going on in their brains. My role was to find out what they thought and felt about these performances. So let me show the outcome of the analysis. Here we look at uh, the players, their brain, and we look at the difference between the two different modes of playing, the improvised minus the non-improvised. What we see here is that an area called the Broadman area number nine lights up, and that area is taken to be especially involved when, they, when you need sustained attention, use of working memory, and uh, inhibit responses. Now it's the difference between musicians and listeners' brains. There is more activation in the player's right hemisphere than in the listeners. Now we do something, uh, we focus on special moments during the music. So David Dolan picked out what he felt was artistically very moving small fractions of the music. And you see that the, the map now is much more grey and the conclusion is of course that the more magic, the, the more engaging the music is, the more similar is the activation of the listeners and the musicians' brains. And this is what happens in, in the improvised. If you look at this in the non-improvised, we don't get this uh, match between uh, uh, musician and listeners' brains. The psychological findings and the EEG findings were very consistent with one another, in that in both cases, the improvised performances showed very significant differences to the non-improvised in the same direction of greater engagement in the case of the improvised performances. If I play these, these, which is quite a not nice wrong note, and then, you know, stop in horror, it's not going to be an experience that either us, performers, or audiences will enjoy. But I'll try to, to fall into the same kind of accident and, and do something with it. With it. Uh, so I repeat the accident, if you wish, and try to include it in the flow. And we know that that kind of state of performing mind was a part of uh, improvising, actually something that we call music appoggiatura, which is the note that leans on the harmony from outside it. Uh... So this becomes, instead of a wrong note, the, the note of interest, the note that creates the expressive moment. And all that has to do with the improvising state of mind. And again, in a way, in bringing the, the element of spontaneity, of engagement, of, of connecting with, with audience back to life. Besides of the excitement of analyzing music and uh, the uh, effect of uh, teaching musicians to be able to improvise, there is another uh, spin-off, if you like, of the, um, the project, namely to understand better how you actually get information out of these wiggly lines. Although, of course, we don't claim that we are the first to do this. People are working on this, but there isn't any, any routine mathematical toolbox that you can just apply on these signals and then 
figure out what, what the diagnosis should be. So therefore, we hope, of course, that this will have uh, uses far beyond this specific music project and to be something that could help uh, in daily life in, in uh, neuro clinics. Mm -hmm.